Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Environmental Social Justice. I'm your host, Wendy Nystrom, and today's special guest is Stephen Power, and he is the president of Home for Welcome, Steve. Hello. Thanks for having me. Anytime. And one thing, you know, talking about green construction. So your company, Homefront Build, is a design build company that focuses on green architecture. So could you explain to people, um, you know, as you start with your background and what that means to be green? First of all, it, one correction is we're Homefront Build. We have two companies, Homefront Build and Carbon Check. Homefront yes. Build uh, began about 25 years ago uh, dealing with uh, traditional homes, homes in Los Angeles that uh, part of the historic vernacular styles found here, Victorian craftsmen, uh, Spanish colonial revival, mission revival, uh, mid-century modern. Um, and that's where we I began uh, my practice. And out of that grew uh, green construction because by preserving older structures and uh, insulating them and maybe adding a heat pump, we realized, wow, we're the greenest people around. But I wanted to talk to a broader audience uh, with this practice, and that's how we evolved Carbon Shack. Carbon Shack really is targeted specifically to, let's say, uh, you know, more contemporary market, someone who wants a contemporary product and who might be scared away by seeing a craftsman on our website. So, you know, didn't want to scare away people who wanted to optimize their relationship with nature and reduce their uh, impacts in the way that they build or, or furnish their homes. So that's why we began Carbon Shacks in order to make sure that we this green practice we had evolved was able to talk to the widest uh, audience possible. So, so we're both firms were design construction. That means we have architects, interior designers, interior decorators, and tradespeople on staff, and a slew of subcontractors. I think that the way to think of what we do is we're like a concierge for how you live and build sustainably. We optimize uh, the relationship between the choices you make when you design, build, and furnish uh, your, your homes or your shelters with the environment, we pull it all together. Um, too often, uh, I see projects come to me designed by uh, an architect or a designer, and they haven't in any way integrated insulation. They haven't thought about HVAC. They're just lines on a paper. They're rooms you know, put together in a beautiful way. Maybe it's a butterfly roof, which of course is horrible for waterproofing. In other words, beautifully designed, but not optimized and thought of as a holistic organism for reducing impacts. And often those those designs will be, oh, throw it to the subcontractor, let the HVAC person, the plumber, somebody else figure it down the line. But when you don't integrate those things up front, maybe you're under insulating and making the HVAC work harder. So, you know, that puts more stress on your solar. In other words, you know, so what we do is we pull that whole thing together and create holistic designs, which is really lacking, uh, horribly lacking in the field. So, yes, that's you know. true. No, I mean, in my in my limited research and knowledge about green construction, um, historically, like I'm talking a couple hundred years ago, people did incorporate green construction and how they orientated the building of the house or how they insulated it to maximize the heating and cooling. And we've kind of drifted away from that. So what you're doing is you're bringing this knowledge back and saying this is the right way to do it. This is the economical way to do it. And this is the low carbon way to do it. <laughs> yes, exactly. You're exactly right. Before the industrialization of home heating and air conditioning, we used uh, cross ventilation. We used the Spanish colonial style, thick walls, double walls, you know, to yeah. reduce the heat transfer and things like that. So all those old techniques were out of desperation, right? Then we invented uh, ways to heat and cool the home and do things like that. And we just relied on energy. And now what we need to do is we need to, you know, yes, pull back and look at some of those old greener practices and combine them with the advances of technology and heat pumps and things like that. I, I'm so glad you brought that up because so many people think green construction. And as you said, it's not living in a yurt with no heat and electricity. You yeah. can modernize it. So explain to people they can live a very modern life. They can have all of the you know uh, luxuries they want. It's just green. Yeah. Yeah, a common misconception of living green is doing without suffering. And uh, whereas, you know, it is, as you say, living in, in a yurt with uh, with an outhouse out there, but it's not. I mean, I, you know, I hate to use the easy example, but the easy example is a Tesla, right? Like people drive Teslas because they're cool. They're fun to drive. They're high technology. 
I mean, full self-driving and all that, you know, it's just, these are the, these are the coolest, sexiest, most beautiful things uh, to drive. They're fun to drive. They're amazing. Oh, and they're green, you know? So, you know, that's the way we have to think of uh, living in our homes. I mean, you know, and, and the other thing is that the other, the maybe paradigm shift we need to make is that the um the climate is the economy the climate is our pocketbook the climate has impacts on our pocketbook also so oh, yeah. and and comfort so when you're thinking about living green it, it's our argument is it's it's living with all the comforts and none of the downsides of, of stress on the environment and stress on your pocketbook i have a full solar array on my house and i'm pay nothing for powering my two EVs and heating, cooling my house, nothing. It's free. It's amazing. So living green is, is not doing without it's doing with more. And just, you know, doing the right thing. It's it. I mean, people say, Oh, I'll just jack up the AC or jack up the heat or you just, how about this? Build it the right way. Seal up the house, make the house. So it doesn't leak heat in the winter time or leak air conditioning in the summertime. Um, just build, build it the right way. So you save money. Yeah. Build it the right way so you're you you have better, you know, you're you're more comfortable. Build it the right way so that you have comfort and and saving. You know, not even save the environment. I mean, that's the argument we we make because because you know, often if we just tell people to you know, do it because you want to save the environment, that it just doesn't it just doesn't reach as broad an audience as we'd want. It's unfortunate but true. I, I still have ringing in my ears my dad saying, "Close the door." <laughs> Turn off the lights, and it's like, yeah. Right. So I, I was yeah. raised that way, you know. Close the refrigerator the door. door, yeah. Close the refrigerator door. I mean, I still have it ringing in my head, and that was just how you grew up. Energy yeah. is expensive. I mean, yeah. you want to cut your costs. And with what you're doing, with you know, um, explain to people because they may not fully understand what embodied carbon means. Yeah. So there's two things when we're uh, looking at um, st uh, structures and shelters and and what we you know the structures we live in. There's the embodied energy cost, the embodied carbon cost, and the operational carbon cost. Mm -hmm. The operational carbon cost uh, were pretty, is, has been a part of the conversation for a long time. That's the day-to-day -day carbon cost of living in there, heating your air, cooling your air, heating your, heating your water, cooking, uh, refrigerator, things like that. So the easy, uh, everybody knows, you have an all electric house, you put a solar array on top, maybe you have a battery, Boom! You know your um, your you've reduced your uh, your carbon footprint in the operational side, the day to day living side, to net zero maybe. Uh, so, but the other part of the carbon equation in the shelter is the embodied carbon. Embodied carbon stands for the one time carbon cost of building or making something. So that's uh, the one time carbon cost of lumber and tile and roofing to make the structure or the one-time carbon cost to uh, fire in your tile, making the uh, making the heat pump hot water heater, things like that. So you have to, as we we're, we're very advanced in the conversation on lowering the operational uh, carbon footprint, but we're less advanced on the embodied carbon footprint. And as we make more and more uh, progress uh, with uh, the lowering the operational carbon footprint, we still have to we still have to uh, make more progress. So we have to look at the embodied carbon footprint. Yeah, and I mean, just so people understand, I mean, this is everything that goes into it. The, the transportation, um, the carbon from just trucking it to the site, um, making the product, delivering the product, installing the product, it all gives off carbon emissions or pollution. Yeah, and, exactly. the, you yeah. know, the um, when you think about tile, most people don't buy tile lo manufactured locally. They buy it manufactured in China or, the Middle East or, or, you know, yeah. and so when you think about the carbon footprint of all those container ships circling the globe all the time, transporting our goods, you know, all around, that's one of the major uh, causes of, um, you know, climate uh, warming gases is those, all those uh, container ships. And having worked in insurance, I learned that a lot of those containers do fall into the ocean quite frequently. Do they really? They uh, do. Now, I, I was talking to a Marine guy and he's like, oh yeah, all the time. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't either. It's just something they don't talk about. I guess it's expected, but you know, yeah. that kind of ad, you have to then produce more, make more, deliver more. Right. It's crazy. Local is important. People yeah. are really important. The thing, what I tell people is that, you know, there are certain things when we're building 
that uh, you can't, um, that you, you have to buy manufactured new. And so, you know, for example, uh, tile. But if you buy things that are durable and local, you're going to reduce your carbon footprint. So durable means that, you know, you buy tile, okay, that has a higher carbon footprint than a wood floor, but it's going to last a lot longer. Okay. And if you, then you um, source it locally, then you've reduced all that transportation costs. So, you know, one mantra to keep in mind when you're shopping or, or thinking about things is uh, buy, buy durable, buy local. Yeah, I think, and you also just brought up the full circularity of that is, you know, if it lasts longer, I mean, I have two large dogs, wood will not work for me. <laughs> we, we are stone floor people yeah. and um, that works well. But yeah, durable is important, buy once, buy right. And um, it might cost a little more upfront, but you're not replacing it in 10 years. It's gonna last yeah. 50, 100, that's important. Yeah, one, one plug for one of our websites. We have this one website, it's called sustainablebuild.org. And on that website, we um, have these really powerful calculators where you can plug in your, your zip code within the United States, continental United States, and it'll show you the sort of average house in your area. And then you can go through a menu and make one or many choices of like, I wanna change my dishwasher. And then if you, you know, choose energy, it'll show you the carbon uh, impact operational and uh, embodied carbon impact on your choice so that what you can do because often we have a, a fixed budget and you know we want to use it in the most you know optimize our uh, our um, impact for that budget and what this uh, website will do is it'll show you that um, if you the biggest impact may come from this choice rather than that choice so it's a really wonderful uh, powerful calculator and tool you can design your whole house and see on average of course it's not it's it's general but it gives you a general idea of if i make these choices how does that reduce my impact um, you know on the environment and we did this because we wanted people to learn from all the um, you know, uh, knowledge that we've gained. So it's an open source website, anybody can use it. And it gives you an idea of how to select and make your choices when you're, um, you know, uh, designing or building uh, or make it a simple change of, you know, uh, maybe, you know, what's the difference between a heat pump dryer versus a regular dryer, things like that. Yeah, and that's important that people know because when there's, let's say someone is a novice. I mean, you and I work in this industry, we know the lingo, we know what to do. But someone who doesn't is going to want baby steps. They're not going to understand where, how do I even start? And having a resource like that, they can at least pick out appliances or see what the footprint is. But also with your company and what you do, you help people. You work with a client directly through those little baby steps of how to get there. Yes. I mean, that's it. Is that, you know, the sort of high class word is where the concierge were helping people, you know, figure out how to best use their budget. The other day I talked to a client and, you know, this was just in about building performance and, and she has a, um, a tankless, gas tankless hot water heater, but it's relatively new. But she has a fixed budget, but yet her you know, HVAC is kind of wearing out. So you know, what's the best way to use her money to have the most impact? So we actually decided on a supplemental electric tank near her primary shower to give her a little bit more uh, you know, hot water, keep the tankless, but then put um, you know, a heat pump in to heat and cool the house and make a cup and then get an induction uh, cooked up. So, you know, again, it's just like, you know, too often uh, people are uh, scared away from being green or something because they think they have to be perfect and, you know, they have to be orthodox. Yeah. I mean, I also use the example of, you know, how many lead, lead home, uh, lead for home homes are there? Very few in Los Angeles. How many, uh, you know, you know, uh, other homes that, that meet some sort of standard, there are almost none because nobody can meet those standards. And if we push, if we turn people away or push people away because they can't be perfect and they can't be orthodox, we're losing out on, on people's small uh, changes that they can make. And in order to have uh, any kind of effect and, and progress, we have to accept that people can, are only gonna be able to maybe make limited choices. And we wanna optimize and help them figure out how to, you know, best use their budget to have the most impact on their budget, their and the and the and the environment. Oh, absolutely. I mean, small changes will have a big effect, and everyone, you know, every little step helps. That is so important to know. Yes, and I like that. the thing is that, you know, these small steps lead to political change. I always try to make people yeah. remind people of that because, 
you know, if you get a heat pump hot water heater, you've sort of educated yourself. You're now sort of trending down a road of, oh, I see uh, what this does. And I see how these policy uh, choices and these policy uh, impacts matter. So even just, you know, making one little uh, choice like buying an EV or getting a heat pump hot water heater, those things actually begin to change our political, uh, you know, approach too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, once people start, you know, once people start talking with their wallets and their pocketbooks, change happens pretty much that way. But um, the beauty of the uh, what you do, just going back to your business, you remodel homes, but you, you do traditional and contemporary homes. And when someone says, you know, I have a kitchen from 1910 and they want to keep that look, but they want to update it, they're not going to lose the beauty of it because you're able to incorporate the modern with the traditional and still make it feel like a 1910 but without having all that waste. Yeah, I mean, we do uh, remodels and new construction and additions. We do uh, the full gamut of work uh, in homes, but it's it's very easy because um, a lot of the upgrades that you have for your systems or anything are mostly behind the scenes. They're in the basement, they're on the roof, they're out of sight, <laughs> out of mind. So it's very easy to take a, a traditional home, keep it looking, uh, traditional and make all these upgrades and uh, and you know improve the performance of the, of the house. Um, the uh, of course the only downs the only caveat is with the induction cooktops. Induction cooktops look modern because there's a piece of glass, you know. Yeah. But they do have induction ranges. So the, the downside, the induction uh, cooking is amazing. If anybody who's cooked with it will never turn back. But uh, the 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 companies that make uh, appliances have not come up. Everybody carries induction, but not that many people. There's not as many design choices out there at the moment. So there are ranges with induction cooktops. Um, so there are choices, but that would be my only caveat. Yeah. But then, of course, you know, a traditional house would have been cooking with uh, wood fired, uh, you know, ovens. So, you know. Nope. <laughs> but, but so people understand what induction is, is in that we have to have a special pot as well that when it touches it, it heats. Yeah. And the induction is amazing. It's uh, it's done. It's electromagnetic. So you have to have cast iron. So uh, any cast iron skillet or Le Creuset or things like that um, really are, you know, is what is what you need. But induction is this amazing technology. I mean, I went into a restaurant the other day and and they they're using induction to cook omelets and they're like, it's it's perfect because you know they set the temperature and it's just like it can you know continues to cook omelet after omelet so it's a very advanced way of cooking the problem is that you know it's it's digital not you know not analog whereas you know with gas you turn it on you see it and you, feel the flame and, you know it's very tactile and we all watch iron chef and blah 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 but induction uh is so efficient gas 70 percent of the energy that uh that when you cook with gas goes into the atmosphere, it heats your kitchen up. That's why kitchens are so That's miserable. True. Yeah. Induction, 90% of the energy goes into the cooking vessel. So you have a very cool kitchen. And also you don't have all that off gassing, all that toxic uh, pollution from, from burning natural gas in your kitchen. Oh, yeah. When you burn natural gas to heat water or heat the air, you have to duct it to the outside. But somehow when we burn natural gas in the kitchen for cooking, we're allowed to keep it inside. No, you know, it's one of the leading causes of uh, childhood asthma. So Induction, again, you know, living green is living with, you know, technology and living with all the advancements. It's uh, also safer, right? Like, so when you take that pot off, you can put your hand on oh, it. Oh, yeah, it's very cool. safe and very easy to clean. None of those nooks yeah. and crannies and grates. I mean, it's just a, it's a it's a surface, so it's absolutely wonderful to cook with. Yeah, I, I was I, I had never seen one until probably 10 years ago when I was like, you could put your hand up. Wait, what? And I yeah. say, yeah, touch it. I'm like, I'm not touching yeah. that. Well, the problem with induction is it's done with electric. And so people think, oh, I remember in the 70s or the 60s or the you know 80s or whatever cooking. And I grew up in a house with an electric uh, you know, cooktop and they are horrible. They they don't ramp up very quick and they ramped it. So there's no there's no control on it. And oh, they're absolutely just the worst, the worst, the worst. Uh, I, I burned myself pretty bad as a kid. Yeah. I, I put my hand on the burner. <laughs> oh, yeah, and it's and so it's very immediate. You get the energy right away. You can boil water in minutes. It's absolutely, it's completely different than electric. Uh, it's right. great, and that you you use less energy because it's yeah. so fast and so efficient and 
cost less in the long run right. because you're not wasting anything. Yeah. Um, can we switch over to carbon check so people understand the store and what you're doing with that? I, what, I did, I, it's not that I forgot to introduce it at the beginning. I was actually going to segue oh, gracefully okay. <laughs> into the end. <laughs> but that's a store. I mean, that's you're actually making, like, yeah. stuff, repurposing, yeah. which is, I, I love the idea. Yeah. <laughs> but the story of Carbon Check comes out of working with traditional homes, because by working with traditional homes, we began to deconstruct houses to save all the parts for our, 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 our additions and stuff. And it's, so instead of just valuing historic architecture, we began to value historic material because it was like this beautiful old growth Douglas fir and redwood. And it's like, why are we throwing that stuff in the trash? We should be reusing it. But um, so we did this one project house that we call Casa Zero, sort of a case study house where we tried to put together uh, how to, you know, the operational carbon footprint with the embodied carbon footprint. So since we had been in the business of taking houses apart in the inner city, to that were in the way of demolition and reusing them for our historic projects, we thought, wow, you know, we're the greenest people around because we're lowering embodied carbon footprint by reusing this, this, these materials that otherwise would go to the dump. And we're also yeah. putting solar panels and insulating these houses. So we're, we're lowering operational. So we put those two things together in a contemporary build and that would be called Casa Zero. And uh, it was really, we just pushed the front on everything. The, the house is, there's a uh, video on our website that shows the time-lapse photography of taking this house apart that would have gone to the dump, quantifying how much that costs versus, you know, leveling it and taking it off to the dump, and then rebuilding our new house out of it. And uh, it really was, you know, wonderful. We were doing all these innovative things with heat pump hot water heaters at the time and heat pumps and everything, blah, blah, blah. But what we got frustrated with was the whole story was uh, trapped inside the uh, inside the walls. The the story of what we were doing with lowering our our carbon footprint was on the roof, was in the basement, was outside. You know, you didn't see it. We didn't bring it into the life. So my wife, who uh, is an artist who works at the intersection of art and science, she always wanted to uncover or visualize the invisible nature that we live with in our houses in order to tell the story of of how our choices impact the environment so that led to this wonderful journey where we began to take the story from inside the walls and and from the basement and bring it into the furnishing so that the occupants of our house uh, of the, our our houses that we design live with that story of nature and and making visible the invisible and 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 prior and and our um you know our uh, our impacts on nature making that a part of the beauty of nature, not the negative, but the beauty of nature and the importance of preserving it into the daily uh, life of the people who live in the house. So we have all these products, hemp uh, drapery with beautiful patterns, you know, from the microscopic, and we have uh, furniture from rec reclaimed lumber and tile and just every, every uh, you know, part of the house, all the furnishings had a story. And then we thought, oh, well, we should sell these. And that began the showroom. And I love the fact that, you know, you're taking these things and making it into something beautiful because whenever I see something get demolished, um, you know, gr growing up mostly East Coast, Midwest, and I would see things get torn down, I would see just old structures and the beautiful woodworking that was done and the beautiful tile work get thrown into a skip. And I thought, I want to dumpster dive. For, I mean, I was probably 10 years old. I wasn't allowed anywhere near it, but I wanted to dumpster dive and pull that stuff out and keep it because, I mean, someone made that. That's someone's artwork. And it's just being discarded. And it kind of broke my heart to see that even as a little kid. Yeah. But so, you know, some of the things that I mentioned, you know, we we can't recycle, right? We can recycle uh, framing lumber and things like that. But typically, you can't recycle most tile. So that's where For we... artwork, if you wanted to, you know, use the broken tile as like... Yeah. A oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, when we're building new, we just need so much new material. So looking yeah. at how to reduce the carbon footprint of new material was part of that journey of the Casa Zero. And so making these new tiles and making this new drapery was, you know, using hemp fabric, which, you know, is a miracle plant. It just uses it uh, less water, less pesticides, blah, blah, blah. You know, so there are ways of, of uh, building and using new materials that have lower carbon footprints. No, absolutely. No, with the tile thing, I was just thinking of like a, the artwork side of it is, you know, yeah. making something beautiful out of it rather than throwing yes. it away. Yes, but that's, you know, and we talk about tile, but you know, the thing is that uh, all that framing lumber, I mean, you know, I just still go around Los Angeles today and everything is just, you know, bulldozed, taken to the dump. And uh, when wood decomposes at, the, at a dump, it actually produces more negative carbon, uh, negative uh, climate gases than if you wood chipped it. 
and certainly than if you reused it. So that was what we wanted to demonstrate is that it is actually cheaper to deconstruct a, a structure and reuse the parts than it is to, uh, it's only cheaper for your pocketbook, but it's also better for the environment. Is, wouldn't the wood be better quality if it's older? Yes, exactly. I mean, the, you know, the old, the lumber from house homes hundred years ago is dense old growth out here in California is dense old growth, Douglas fir and redwood. You can't get it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's what I was thinking. Cause um, it's just better quality that we just, we don't have right now. Hopefully we will learn from our ways and let trees grow and become dense again. But on that, how do people find, especially the showroom? I mean, the artwork is, you know, how do they find you? How do they hire you? How do they get to your showroom? <laughs> yeah, so we have uh, two websites. One is the carboncheck.com, which is specifically for people who are interested in sustainability and optimizing their uh, relationship with the environment with the way they build or furnish their homes. And then Home from Build is uh, for people who uh, have traditional uh, homes and want to, uh, or, you know, who want to do additions or remodels. So homefrombuild.com carboncheck.com for the contemporary purely sustainability oriented people and then um, the open source uh, website is the sustainablebuild.org and that's for the calculators so that you can uh, learn from what we've uh, we've been because uh, you know we wanted to share all that knowledge we're not going to be able to build everywhere we you know we're primarily a, a local construction firm we can sell our products nationally and internationally but we're not going to be able to you know, work with everybody. So we want people to learn from what we've learned. And that's what I love about your mission and everything you're doing is that you're, you want to help everyone. You want to share with everyone, which is, which is great. I mean, what you're doing is fantastic and teaching we people have, how to live green. Yeah. We have to change quickly. <laughs> we do. Oh yeah. yeah. We need to, it's, it's now, we need to stop, you know, the meetings and stop the workshops and stop the discussions <laughs> and just Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I hate to say it. I, I, I have somebody who's a scientist. I'm like, I don't need another scientist telling me that the glaciers are like, like I got that. We need to move beyond. Like we know that it's we a know. problem. Now we need to do something about it. Uh, preach it to the choir. I've been, I've been arguing that for years. It's like, <laughs> pull the trigger. Let's do it. Yeah. So thank you, Steve. Thank yeah. you guys so much. Um, please well, check him out. Please check out all the work that you're doing. I love the the websites that you have, especially the one helping people calculate their carbon footprint, that's important because um, people are just not going to know. They, they have, I mean, the first time I calculated my personal carbon footprint, I was a little shocked. So it's a good awakening to have. Um, but guys, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Wendy Nystrom, your host with Environmental Social Justice. Steve, thank you again. Homefront Build is fabulous. Carbon Check, fabulous. What you're doing, please check them out. You're welcome. Take care. Thank you for having me. <clears throat>